All right, so it's a really important component of life, sensing things. And what about responsive, right? Generating some response. So, so we can give that to nervous tissue, that function of life. And, and, and in fact, we can wrap a lot of homeostasis into that tissue, can we? We can make the muscle the effectors, which we should, but the nervous tissue, oh, sorry, nervous tissue over here, nervous tissue is going to be that command, that control, and that sensor, absolutely, Jane. So that's what I'm asking students to think about. Say, now, right, we can't forget what we just learned. We want to pull that along, and we want to add to that. Because if you bothered to go through the pain of listening to me for the last, you know, three, four weeks, right, and then taking a test, you, you really want to, you want to keep that. Nobody, nobody might take that away from you. Keep that. So let's build. All right. So this is, and again, okay. Let's be, let's, let's, let's turn on the right light, set light. Let's be honest. If, if, my, if this is the first time you are doing microscopy, right? In other words, the first time you do a microscope. Most of the stuff that you look at in a microscope is going to look like abstract art. That's what I tell you. It's going to look like I, I, this should be hanging in a museum. It's like the crazy interpretation of somebody's reality, right? That's what we said, abstract art is. Are you guys with me? Is that the kind of feeling you have when you look under those mics? Okay, so it takes a little time. Time is a key. You will get this in time. But you have to you have to be generous with that time. That's part of the whole step changing some large study strategies, right? Um, if you're able to come up on Fridays and spend some time on the microscope, it's great. If you're not, right, we can find other times for you. Right? I don't teach a lab, but I'll be right there if you need me to. I mean, all you have to do is just send me an email and say, you know, I'm, I'm coming up at such and such a time, will you be around? Right? I've done microscopy all my life. I love microscopy, all right? It's so much fun. But uh, I wouldn't have said that sitting in your place in the beginning. It would have been, oh gosh, this is somebody else's interpretation of something that I just don't see. Okay? So, so um, what you're going to see on your slides are biopsies of entire, generally entire, walls of structures like the lungs, right? Or the intestines. They might call it the genome or the kidney, right? And those are beneficial because they, they're easy to get and make a slide from. And they also show you the organization, right? That's really key to life, right? But you have to get the pattern of organization, which is harder, okay? All right? And so uh, sometimes you will have a smear. This is not a smear. This is a biopsy. This is a piece of the wall. And, and this is a cool one. So what we've got is uh, we've got cancerous versus normal. So this kind of gives you the idea of that disorganization that occurs in a cancer. So we were moving along like this and then boom, all of a sudden we had excessive growth of cells and we lost this nice orderliness. So even if it doesn't look orderly orderly to you, this in fact is. This is a simple columna. It throws students because simple means one layer and only one layer of cells. And they're like, well wait, I see all this other stuff under here. How can that be one layer of cells? I'm like, well we're just referring to this tissue. The tissue just under here is a connective tissue, and this is an epithelium. So one of the things I tell students to give them a little hint about how you discriminate, how you tell the difference between these guys, is epithelial tissue, right, which in, there's all the different types basically up there, and you, you're going to have to discriminate them in a few. You'll discriminate some of them in lab on slides for your first practical, and I will give you a few additional examples in lecture, all right? Okay. So, I say, but there's there's commonalities. There's things, you know, we're, we're discriminating means we're going to tell the difference. But what do they all do? And that kind of thing is very important, right? So this slide is nice to illustrate something. You'll notice that next to the epithelial, not the connective here, is space, right? This is all space. That white, there's nothing there, okay? Um, generally, that means you got a tube, right? Unless your skin, and that might be the outside of the body, right? You know, that, that white space. Generally, space means you, you're next to a tube, right? So I tell students, you know, epithelial tissue is always first contact. This is the tissue in which you engage with the world around you. All right? Oh, is that wood? Uh-huh. Yeah. So this outer layer here, so where's our skin? Oh, all kinds of skin models here. This will be chapter five, and this will be after your practical because the skin's on the next practical. But, right? So here in the skin, what we've got is we've got this whole layer, layers really, we're going to learn. Um, epithelial tissue. So layers, that means it's not going to be simple. All right? So we're not going to call this simple epithelium of any sorts. All right? So, but it's in common with all those other ones in that it is first contact. All right? And in fact, when you look at this 
If you come up here and look at this, you'll notice the white on the edge of every single of these images. These they're called micrographs instead of photographs, but that's fine. It's always you've got some white, with the exception of that one, because it's a delay under this. You can't see the white; it would be right here in the middle. All right. So first contact, and that is whether it's skin or it's inside your body, right? So all these tubes, because you're just a bunch of tubes, right? I mean, no, no insult. So is a lot of life on this planet. A bunch of tubes that are highly organized and put together in a very, very meaningful and purposeful way. But a bunch of tubes, all right? And so on, in those tubes, the walls have these tissues in it, right? So this is one of the tubes, and this is the wall of the tube, to give you perspective, all right? So the side of the wall that makes contact with the outside world is always epithelium. It'll always be epithelium. So that throws students at first, because they, they think, oh wait, this, this gastrointestinal tract, right? This whole digestive, and we've got a bunch of boards over here, this whole digestive tract. This is, this is not outside the body, Dr. Parsons. What are you talking about? Are you, are you, you know, are you in credentials as useless class? Right? This is not outside. Yes, it is, right? Everything inside this tube came from outside and directly from outside. It is not in the body yet, because I said, we have to absorb it. It has to make it past all these cells that line all these tubes. Because these are all just a bunch of continuous tubes from your mouth to your anus. Uh, yes, Katie. I read something that said that humans are basically just weirdly shaped donuts. Well, you know, it's nonsense. It's just, you know, but we, we don't all circle. That's the whole thing. This is a this is not a circular tube, right? It just it's a straight, complete tube. Sometimes there are, like the, the, the blood vessel, you could say that for, because it's a circuit, right? It starts, we started at the heart, and it would end at the heart. I'm saying that's but, a hole. Yeah, well, but it's, again, a donut would be totally enclosed, and, 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 and that's, again, it's in a circle like that. And it's so, if you do it in a cross section, yes, it would. But that would be a series of donuts, right? It's perspective. You have to line it up as a series of donuts. And then you do. And some of the donuts look rounder than other donuts, okay? So the example that Katie gave is really good because this is where you're going to run into problems on your slide. The slides are in different orientations. Many of them are, for that donut's sake, a cross section. So if you take a cross section for the esophagus, it's a donut, right? It's an enclosed tube, right? If you do a longitudinal set, section like what that slide is, it doesn't look like a donut, all right? It looks like a long, open banana, maybe. I don't know, but <laughs> what, what, what would work for you? Carved out banana, all right? Okay. So, um, but that's really important because I, I say to students, you know, you'll really succeed in doing microscopes if you learn how to think in 3D. Well, gosh darn it, you already do, don't you? In fact, you don't think in two dimensions normally, do you? But a microscope slide is two dimensions, right? Because all you can see is a plane at a time, two dimensions. So, so I say, you know, if you're trying to figure out what the heck you were looking at in the perspective on the slide, you need to think about what it looked like when it was in the body, right? So that's again. But that a whole track is lying, right? Down to all these rugae and everything in the stomach, that's all epithelium. It's all epithelium is always first contact. The lining of your, your genital tracts and your kidneys, first contact. Right? And yeah, I agree with you, Katie. If I cut through the ureter like that, I got a donut. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where the pee would be, but here's where all your blood is being filtered. Still donuts. In a cross section. Alright? I was gonna, I was gonna ask about the, uh, the yeah. stomach lining. Uh, so is it just epi is it typical epithelium that's in the stomach lining, or is there actually okay? Or so or in the whole right? wall, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Okay. But first contact is just simple colonial. That can it can heal, survive it. Yeah. Or, oh wow. Okay. You replace it all the time though. Oh, that, that's yeah, one of the, yeah, that's See, now this is another one of our commonalities yeah. to epithelium. It's first contact. It's highly mitotically active, right? So that all that mitosis we talked about in chapter three, yeah. this one's doing it all the time. That's why we mentioned yeah, it. Cancer, yeah. cancers are often active. Yeah. They're often yeah. active. So, um, so what else do what else do epithelium have in, contact, in, in common? And they don't all do this, but here's the three things you always want to remember. I, I'm, and I'm dead serious. Just three. It's all of, uh, just today. Just three for epithelium. It absorbs. Remember first contact. It secretes. So that means every gland in your body is epithelium, and it protects. And some protect better than others. So think about that. Think about what of these functions are you going to specialize in as a tissue. So here's your skin, right? You ever think about it? Maybe you haven't. 
you, you can't even get to the blood through the skin because epithelium is also, by the way, avascular. It doesn't have blood vessels in it. <laughs> no blood vessels. So that means even if something comes in contact with you, there's a bacteria or virus or something, it's not getting in your body and moving all through your body because that's what they do. They use your blood vessels as a river to transport. So epithelial tissue won't have blood vessels. There's none in your epidermis. Zero. So you know automatically if you cut yourself and you bleed, you've made it through the epidermis. But to do that protection, because that's what it's really good with. Your skin does some secretion because of these glands we're going to look at. Your skin is not going to absorb stuff. So, so expel that myth that was in your head. Your skin is not going to absorb much. And not for the body itself. It might You might get some of that collagen or something in your makeup or your, your lotions. It's, but it's not a really good way. So like to, essential oils? Yeah, they're going to stay right in this area. Okay, they're not, you don't want them in your body anyway. Okay, you want to stay in just the area. Okay? So, why do you want your body to try to clear that? It can't even mix with the blood. Yeah, but it's, it's not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Jane, we'll talk about that another day. <laughs> right now. So, so, again, in areas like the stomach, the blood vessels will be right underneath here. So, epithelial tissue is never far from a blood vessel, but your skin since it makes so much contact with the outside world and the outside world is so not nice, right? It really benefits us, it behooves us to have many, 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 many layers of epithelial cells. And in that case, we use the term stratify, right? Because stratified means layer. So when you see these tissues, the first thought in your mind should be, okay, now why does it look that way? That really, it'll make your life a whole lot more fun, I promise you. Why does it look that way? What's that going to do for me? Because these came, these, you know, even if we, most of our slides are from small animals, but the idea is you have the same cell. So why? What is the benefit of that? Because you have to rise where you are because of many, 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 many years of evolution, right? You know, you didn't come about all this stuff accidentally. There was a lot of trial and error in a lot of species on this planet. You have come to a really good solution to the problem of staying alive. Because that's what I was saying. The problem is, how do you stay alive? in a world that changes, okay? So I know, like I said, I, I haven't even brought up anything off the slide yet, but I'm trying to get you guys to think. So when you hear me say these things, again, I'm trying to get you to consider it. What is the challenge? What do I want to know? How should I approach this information? So it is easier for me to relate to it, because if I relate to it, I learn it, right? If, if I've got, I'm looking at French, something that's written in French, I'm not going to learn it because I can't relate to that. I don't speak that language. I don't read that language. You get it? And the same thing will happen with this. Even though it's written in English, believe it or not, based on, you know, most of our language is based on other languages, okay, right? You still have to relate. So find that in yourselves. Find that area. So, okay. So again, tissues that we've already said, this is just a bunch of cells now organized together for a common function, a common role, some purpose. But there are only four. We're not going to add any more. What we do is we then subdivide, right? That's where it gets kind of ugly, doesn't it? We have to, oh man, you said only four, but now i got to learn central and stratified and, and cuboidal and columnar. So please remember, they are actually, we are describing what it looks like. So there's characteristics, right? And what it looks like gives it a function, and a function you want. All right, so we, again, have to go back and consider what we've learned in Chapter 3 to move forward into Chapter 4. So, so a long, long time ago, right, we started at the totipotent, <laughs> excuse me, totipotent stem cell, right? One cell, one amazing cell, you know, the combination of mom and dad, egg and sperm, and it began dividing. It just started going nuts with mitosis, right? Just mitosis like every six hours, which is faster than it'll ever happen again in your body. All right? <clears throat> and it started making cells. And I said, you know, you can do the math. One cell becomes 2 to 4 to 8 to 16, right? So 32, 64, yeah. So after a while, when there's enough cells, the cells can start to determine, right? Become this, what we call determine or differentiate. They can become other things rather than just this totipotent cell. Because you're going to need other things as you get to be a multicellular organism. You're going to need different functions. And then each group's going to specialize. Right? But in the beginning, there were actually 
And this happened about two weeks, two weeks after conception, you got this. You got three basic, we call them germ layers, but they're tissues. They're groups of tissues. Ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And that's because, right, you actually formed as a tube. You know, it's like a tube, it's a tube. You actually formed as a tube. Your whole body was a tube, right? You started off as just a ball of cells, like you looked at in the whitefish blastula in lab. That was just a ball of cells, and you looked the same, right? But as you continued to divide and divide, and you needed to stay small, there was a really good reason why you had to stay very, very small. Well, we're going to leave that right now, but, right? So as you did this, you actually formed sheets. You went from a ball to a sheet of cells. And then those sheets actually started to migrate. Literally, it's really cool to watch these videos, right? And it closed into a tube. And this is why we still talk about people having spinal tube defects, like spina bifida, is because the tube didn't seal. And then they're challenged for life because that event didn't occur. But that's the way it is. So what happens from the sheet is so you have these three sheets, think of like an Oreo cookie or sandwich of some sort, right? With three different layers, right? Well, the top layer basically closes and surrounds everything else. And it creates the container, the donut, if you will, Katie, right? So the outer part, right? And then there's a middle, and then there's an inner layer, okay? So meso means middle. Endo is inside, and ecto is on outside or on top. Okay? Now, the reason we bring this up is because it turns out that all the other tissues are going to come from these. But this is the first stage of organization for you guys. Okay? And, and so we typically say that the ectoderm is going to be your skin and your nervous tissue because that's still what's on the outside of you today if you consider yourself as one, you know, really large tube. Your mesoderm is usually your bone and your muscle and then a few of the, the, the blood and some of the... Um, some of the glands. And then your endoderm is that innermost lining that's still inside of you. The lining of your digestive tract, your your genital tract, okay, your lungs, right? Your glandular tissue, like your thyroid, that's all there. Right? So your book just begins by talking, reminding you that this is where you all started. And and you had to do this because your time in mom was not forever, right? Mom was gonna do all these things for you. You were going to be tasked with trying to stay alive. Remember, I said the biggest problem we have is survival. Staying alive right after the birth, after the birth. So we begin with this, and we don't, we don't really want to leave that behind. The book just mentioned it's not the big point of the chapter. It's just a way that, to remind you that, okay, this stuff formed a long time ago, and you were organized, right, before birth, and really well organized because you had to form everything. Okay, so that's just a you know a nice image to show this idea. All right, now tissue membranes. So this is a category, a membrane. So a membrane is basically something that contains. Right. So when you guys did your um, molecular movement lab, and you make you stuck some syrup inside a dialysis tube, does that ring a bell to anybody? You guys do that in your lab? Okay. Or you might put starch or something inside dialysis tubing and you tie it on the top of the bottom. So we also call that dialysis tubing, we call it a membrane. It was containing. And we called the cell a membrane, right? It had a cell and a membrane. Well, so these, these membranes, since we're larger, not just containing the stuff inside the cell, but generally containing a bunch of other stuff. <coughs> so that's why we talked about serous membranes, right? In chapter one, we said you got this pericardium, that's the proper name for the whole membrane, collectively. You've got your pleural membranes, you've got your peritoneum, okay? So those are all collectively larger containers, right? They define the boundaries for this. And, and membranes, um, they provide a few different functions, but we bring them up now because now we've organized the different tissue types into these membranes. Now, your mucus, serous, and cutaneous We'll have both epithelial and connective, right? Because we're not stopping at tissues, right? We're going to build stuff. And membrane is a stuff. Yeah, Cam. Uh, so is there like a line between you, know, you might have layers of something, and then like one might function as uh, a membrane? Yeah, like, yeah. So, like, is there really so it, the, the, the division blurs. So we would consider um, the simple columnar cells in your digestive tract, for example, and this 
connective tissue underneath it that we saw on our first slide that we call the lamina propria, it's a term for it, okay? We would collectively consider that really a mucous membrane, okay? So what I'm saying here is again that the membranes typically are a collection of different tissue types. And so we can have these individual layers and discriminated tissues like the simple columnar epithelium with this right loose areolar kind of connective tissue, somewhat denser and sometimes dense irregular connective tissue. And we call that a mucous membrane. And it's thicker, right, as compared to like a serous membrane, okay? So a serous membrane would generally be just simple squamous cells. We're gonna look at some simple squamous epithelium, which would be the thinnest possible tissue layer. And some really just some delicate loose areolar connective tissue. And again, these terms will become clear to you guys and hopefully a good move. And that together would be a serous membrane. We didn't say that in chapter one, but now we're saying this in chapter four, okay? And so a serous membrane, I say to students, even with these several layers of tissue, is still like tissue paper. It's just a thin wrapping that if you, you know, ever moved and you didn't want your, your glass stuff to break, because glass when it gets glass will break, you might just wrap it in tissue paper, right? Just keep something to keep everything separate. Well, that's kind of the way serous membranes work. They're just wrapped around all these moving parts and they just want to keep them all separate. Mucous membranes are typically thicker, right? And then cutaneous is very thick. So collectively, right, the cutaneous membrane, we could argue, is all of this. Because when you give somebody a sub, sub beneath, sub cutaneous injection, you're injecting right here. That's where you're doing it. And if you give an injection like that, the way you do it is you create a little tent like that, and you put the needle parallel to the base of the tent. Because in my fingers should be my cutaneous membrane. Okay? So that would be a little bit thicker even. You can take the whole box here. Wow, my allergies are killing me. That cutaneous would be even thicker because it's making contact with a lot more stuff. Right? I mean, I, I can't control what all my body is going to make contact with. To, you know, to some extent, I can't control that. All right? So mucus, serous, cutaneous, all right? They're all some type of epithelium and connective tissue together. And they're basically what they have in common is they create a boundary or something. Like I said, cutaneous is really a boundary between you and the outside world, okay? And then synovial, which we'll talk about exclusively later on between bones and, and muscle, that's you find that in joints. And it is only connective tissue. So just to give you some discrimination, synovial actually is only, only contains connective tissue in it. All right? So again, we, we're trying to now take these cells, organize them together, make some tissues and do things with these tissues. Make them make them help keep us alive. Alright, so this really talks about the mucus, it's just all the words though, right? Lines, cavities, up in the outside world, mucus membranes, all these things. All right, you, you probably said that they often do secrete something we call mucus, right? You know, they are spelled slightly different. There's an O in one and not in the other. But but right, that's what they do. Okay? So Goblet cells, um, if you haven't seen those under the microscope, there's a bunch of other goblet cells. They look like little glasses because they're generally clear. They don't have a lot of, they don't think of a lot of stain. Okay, so goblet cells are single cell glands. And those glands secrete mucus. And mucus is very valuable to us simply because it traps things and keeps them from coming into the body. Right? And in the question Carol had about the stomach, those mucus glands actually protect. They create a nice alkaline barrier that covers the cells, the simple form of cells in the stomach and protects them from the acid that the cells and the glands secrete into the big space of the stomach. Right? So that's in the stomach the they're, they're actually, they line your respiratory tract, they're laying, they line parts of your digestive tract. They're all over in some places, and, and but those are the two common ones. So, and those are both, right, start with mucous membrane, right? And again, they're, it's, epithelium is always on the outside, so they're gonna secrete, clearly mucus is a secretion, right? And it's protective, right? And sometimes, sometimes and in some cases, you, you're gonna definitely need absorption, so. 
Serious membranes, as I said, these are, we've already gone through these, but that's the same image I used from chapter one. So yeah, you've got these double layers. They're sickle squamous on delicate, it's called loose areolar. You guys have probably seen that in lab today, if you haven't already. So this is a type of connective tissue. It's really pretty, and, they, and this is a smear. The sides that we have in lab are smears. So it's not a biopsy from a wall. They just took loose areolar tissue and smeared it across the slide. And so it's really this, this delicate looking right, tissue with a couple cells, but a lot of uh, fibers to it. <coughs> and well, I have a picture for you guys later on in this chapter, but these um, serous membranes do secrete serous fluids. So in this area here, this is gonna have fluid. Fluid is contained. And, and serous membranes never exchange with the outside world, right? They are containers in sterile places. Mucous membranes are not. Mucous membranes have lots of contact with the outside world, and they are not sterile, right? They are the protectors to keep it, keep that the bad stuff from coming in, but they are themselves are not going to be sterile, okay? But serous membranes, oh yeah, they're contained within the big, right, cavities we talked about, and those cavities, themselves are so right and they do a lot again to prevent just rubbing between things and a lot of you know abrasions from forming which would or could kill you all right now and cutaneous we, we cover that in chapter five and synovial membranes we'll cover in depth so i didn't have a slide for those okay we'll cover those in depth when we talk about joints i would say yeah i mean so here was what i was talking to um katie about right the, the donut that she likes here, right? It's like, that's actually kind of dope looking, I don't know, do you know that? It's a little bit of an oblique, it's not quite a cross section, but that's okay. It does remind you that when you guys look at your slides, some of the donuts will be perfectly round and some of the donuts will be oval shaped and some of the donuts will look like this. And that's because when you take a big chunk of tissue out of the kidney or a lung, right, or your intestinal wall, when they cut it out, well, the tubes are going this way, and they're going this way, and they're going this way. I mean, the tubes go all different directions. So if I cut straight across, I'm going to get them appearing sometimes perfectly round, sometimes kind of oval. Sometimes That's why I said thinking in three dimensions really helps you when you do slide work. Right? So, so what is that? Can somebody ask him, like, in lab we're learning? Right? Okay, so these are nuclei. Okay, okay. so there's, and there's, more than two, there's, me, there's more than one. So if, there, if I only saw one in this circle, it's a simple, okay? But this has got several, so we're just gonna call it stratified. We're not gonna, we're not gonna mention, we're not gonna say two layers, three layers, four layers. It's just, if you have one, and here you're looking at the nuclei to line up. Okay. See how they line up here? This is simple because, again, I'm looking for the pattern of these nuclei. Now, nuclei are the largest organelles in the cells, okay? They are stained, especially for contrast, to pick up the very, very dark purple used in the staining that we call hematoxylin, right? So if there's a lot of cells on your slide, I mean a lot of cells, you will see it with your own eyes. The cell will appear darker in some areas and lighter in other areas. And I always say that to students, it's like, look for the contrast with your own eyes. Look with your own eyes and think about what you expect to see. If you can, sometimes you can't, but, but like for the kidneys, the kidneys slides we have, some of them are a complete slice like this. Some of them are just, they, they cut this, because this area is not as interesting for you guys right now, but they cut it like this, all right? When it comes to the small intestine, and this is on your epithelium composite slide, that's what they call it in lab. You will have a kidney, you will have a, uh, a small intestine on there as well. And you see the nice round donut that Katie was talking about, right? You see it as a nice round circle. So when they say composite slides, they have actually biopsied several different structures so they can show you a different views. Which one's the one that looks like cancer? That's going to be your intestines. Okay. Yeah, because in the intestines, I don't think you can see on that, that level, we don't have one of the microscopic ones here, I think. But on the intestines, the intestines, if you open up the pig intestines and the cat intestines, you'll see these tiny, tiny little projections. They're villi is the name for them. That's an actual name for the structure. And they project into the lumen, the space. Because if you've got a tube, this space is always called a lumen. Right? No matter what the tube is, the space that something is flowing through is called a lumen. L-U-M-E-N. Okay? 
And so in an intestine, what we'd have, in the, and then your lower power to see them than this, all right? You would have these kind of projections, and they would be villus, or villi, or you know, villus, singular villi, plural. And so this allows the cells to contact the food better that's in there. So there's always a reason that you see the things too. Yeah. So what's the difference between like stratified and like columnar? Right? Okay, so columnar, I'm actually t- talking about the shape of it. Okay. Oh, so okay. This, this, so we're going to use two qualifiers. How many layers do you have yeah. in the epithelial tissue as a whole, and what are the shape of the cells? And we, we generally, if there's many layers, we're looking at the outermost layer that closest to the space yeah. to name the shape. And there's only three shapes. Okay. Yeah. So you're either, right, and the only two choices, you can either be single or you can be stratified. And then we're going to add, you can either be squamous or squamous, if you're that way. And that means a scale. And think like a fish scale. Thin, flat cells, okay? And then you have cuboidal. That looks like a square, a cube. And this this is a, here, that's a cuboidal, all right? And technically, these, these ones really are close to the cuboidal, though. They're kind of... Kind of columny, 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 and a columnar is a rectangle, and that's all you have, right? Sometimes shapes are subjective, and so it could be it could be challenging, again, especially if you don't get a perfect section. So now these are higher magnification than you guys are probably going to use on your slides. I got to be honest; um, it doesn't tell us what they are, but they are higher. And, and so. I, I can see the membrane around here. I can see the nice round nucleus. There's a membrane, right? There's a line where the next one starts. And, and that's just rows of these, again, simple, right? Simple cuboidal. And, and then this is all, this is classic connective tissue underneath. So this is stratified. This is simple. This is also, again, illustrating that I, they've taken the cut differently in the tube. So it's kind of, you have to orient yourself to what's going on, all right? So now, <coughs> when you're in epithelial cell, there's a couple things to look for. And they're not gonna ask you to identify this in, in lab, but you'll see this, right? You'll see a surface that we said that makes contact. So because I call this a lumen, we often call that the luminal surface. Okay, and it, it, it's important when you go on later on, not, not right now really, but a luminal surface. Sometimes it's called the apical. Because like the apex is like the, the tip of something, right? The apex of a mountain. Or pyramid. So that's called a luminal or apical surface of the cell. And then the cell has to make contact with other tissue, right? It has to be organized. And so when these cells formed way back when you were being developed in utero, they actually produced this protein that's called the basement membrane. So yeah, there's another membrane. It's just a bunch of proteins and sugars and made it sticky and it made it a place or a foundation for the tissue. That's what a basement membrane is. So we often refer to that as a basal surface. If you read that, we're talking about that surface. Now, this becomes important when we start talking about moving molecules, which we're not really talking a whole lot more about in this class, all right? So, but that's why you have to know that. Because this is the cell proper, right? Right here and right here and right here. And so the membrane can have all kinds of different things that we talked about in chapter three. And the membrane on the apical or nuchal side can be way different than that on the basal side. But that becomes important when you go on and you talk more about moving stuff around in the body, molecules, which you're not going to in this class, okay? So your book brings it up, and I'm, I'm trying to just, here's what it means, okay? So, um, Again, other clues that help you know this you gut epithelium is, right, you've got your three functions that we just talked about. You are the absorber, you are the protector, you are the secretor, right? Now, this doesn't mean that other, other tissues can't protect. They certainly can. But if you're epithelial, this is something that you do well. And some of you do it better. Some of the, they, you don't do all of these equally well just because you're epithelial. Like I said, with the skin, I would argue that the skin is outstanding for protection, right? But I would say no, absorption is not its not its function. And typically, actually, secretion isn't. It, it's the specific glands that do that. The specific epithelial glands. So I, I got to again. They are first contact, which means they are avascular. They will not have blood in them. No blood vessels. Here, here's a real kicker. 
every single blood vessel actually is made of epithelial cells. So, try that one on. Yeah, that was us as a fun oxymoron for the students, All right? So, no blood vessels in the tissue. Yep. They are mitotically active, like we talked about, because they, being first contact, are going to need to replace themselves on a regular basis. Right? They need, you, you live because of this skin, y'all. You know that. If you have massive burns and you've lost area, you're, you're likely to die. And you're going to unfortunately die from fluid loss and, and massive infection because you become too vulnerable at that point. Plenty of people die from secondary infection, just you know, skin and bed sores and, and, or compression wounds. Right? It's, it's regrettable, but it's, you understand that this skin is really made for protection. All right? Covers the internal and external surfaces. And it's going to form most of your glands because its job is secretion, and that's what glands do. Right? So I hold on to this, and anything I talk to you for the rest of your life about the body, if it's me, it's somebody else, you've got this. Nobody's taking this away. We're just going to build on it. But these are the, the bases. Here's how this works. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All right. So before we could actually get into all the names that you're getting in lab, because, you know, I, I'm just going to re reinforce that. I mean, the naming is something you'll have time in lab. You'll be looking at it. You'll be thinking about it. But now, hopefully, when you see those pictures, you're thinking more about, okay, now, how does it do this? How does it fulfill what Dr. Barkley told me it does? How does it do that, right? So before we can actually get you together and call you a tissue, we got to put you together. Right? So we got your basement membrane, and it's kind of your foundation, like a basement is in the house. That's where we get the name, right? Well, we also have to hook you together to other cells, right? You've got to, because there's plenty of organisms. I mean, most of this planet is inhabited by organisms that are just one cell. They never had to do this, right? They never had to figure out how to work together and cooperate. Well, they do actually, but they do it differently. <laughs> so, but, but, but they're still, in and of themselves, alive as one cell. Your cells really aren't, right? As your skin cells come off and they fall off on the, well, first of all, they're dead, but if you, if you <laughs> lost right, the skin cells in your mouth or someplace like that that are still living, they're not just going to wander off and be happy to go, you know, do, do their own thing, right? They have now evolved to a point where they are, they are working and cooperating with other cells. So how do we get this, all right? Well, we join them, right? And we've got three choices here that we're going to talk about. It's not that there's only three, but three is a good place for us to start. Okay, so you could be very tightly held together. So here's, here's a cartoon of one cell membrane next to another. These are proteins. Oh, go figure. Remember, there's all kinds of proteins in the cell membrane, right? And these proteins kind of lock together. They're expressed in the membrane of the cell, right? And they kind of lock. So uh, you might think of them kind of like a Velcro in a sense. It's, it's not really the same, but it's, that helps your, because you, you, know, you can't see these without electron micrograph, so. You're not going to see them on your slide. But this holds them together. And it holds them so closely together that we call them tight junctions. And, and, and so nothing gets between these cells. Because that's a space, right? That's an anatomical space. Well, it's a really, really, really small space. But it's a space. And that makes you vulnerable. Right? That makes something that sneak into the body. We've lost our control because we said the plasma membrane is the control. Right? So if you get in between, if you sneak through the cracks, we have a problem. So where would we put tight junctions? What, what, kind, of, what kind of areas in the body would be a good place to put tight junctions? Yeah, Kim? Around the zones in which all the other junctions are. So like well, how around, about just the skin? Oh yeah, well, how about just the skin? How about just the digestive tract? Yeah. The kidneys. Would that be a good place? Fair enough, right? Because those are the things that are contacting the outside world or contacting something that's been in the outside world or something I don't want back. And I don't want it to move through here. So tight junctions sound good? They're going to do their job, aren't they? I'm going to put these in blood vessel walls and things like that. Maybe some things are not just moving freely between cells. They have to go through. They have to meet the requirements of, of molecular transport. All right. Okay, well, that I don't need everywhere because, I, I mean, I get a lot of protection from this epithelium. So what about inside the body? What? Well, I could do these anchoring junctions. So this, again, this is what it says. I'm going to put this kind of, and these, again, are still proteins, but they're different proteins, right? And here's a membrane next to another membrane. And literally, this is called a plaque. So it's a big area where there's a lot of protein. And then there's these fibers. 
right? Fibrous proteins that just kind of weave. It's like reinforced stitching here. That's exactly what that is. Where am I going to put that? Well, I'm going to put that in a tissue that stretches, right? Anything that has to expand, well, I don't want all these cells to be pulled to the limits so they just fall apart, right? You ever try to, they're just going to come apart. Here they are on the floor. Now they're not an organ. Now they're not organized. Now I'm in trouble, right? So stomach, bladder, skin, heart, places that are going to have to undergo a lot of mechanical stress and stretch. I'm going to put these right anchoring junctions, and they, they look at, like different. They come in different forms. You don't have to know the different ones. What did you, you don't have to know the difference between a desmosome and a semi What did you say about where you would find that? In the stomach, in the bladder, in the heart, in the skin, anywhere I'm going to try to expand. The tissue is going to have to expand, and it's going to be. It's going to get what we call mechanical stress. It's going to be affected by that. And or or and. Uh, I'm just kidding. Mechanical stress is basically the same thing as the expansion. Okay. Same idea. If you like the expand better, use expand. Because I, I will say I'll say stretch or expand on the test. Right. All right, and then gap junctions, right? The last category, and, and these are still proteins, but this time the proteins, right? Here's our membrane. Here's our membrane. Lots of space actually, so there's it's good. It's a gap, but this is going to be these junctions or joining of two cells is going to be to allow stuff in the cytoplasm of this cell to move directly into the cytoplasm of that cell. So it's like a, you know, you're 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 bypassing the you gotta go out here and then you kinda come back in here. Right? You're bypassing the transporters out and the transporters in, bypassing endocytosis, exocytosis, any of that stuff, and you're lining up channels really, because these are a, ch a type of channel that are made of proteins, and you're letting something go directly from this cell to this cell. So what would I need to do that for? Well, this tissue is really good at that. Nervous tissue. Because when I want something done, I, I need to do it generally quickly. Right? I don't wanna I wanna bend my arm so that I can point to something, but I gotta wait. Right? I gotta wait here because I'm waiting for the electricity to pass, right, from my brain up here in the frontal cortex all the way down right to these flexor muscles here to my biceps and that just takes time okay there it goes all right no right when i want to bend my arm i bend my arm well the reason i can do this is because right i've got these gap junctions between all the cells in the line of moving that electrical information and they do that they just pass charged ions from one cell to the next cell very quickly so I'll put that in places, like I said, nervous tissue, heart. I'm going to have to do that. Skeletal muscle down some of that. Okay, but nervous tissue, very good at that. All right, again, I don't want to think structure means function. What am I going to do with that function? Or what, what are my options, right? Be creative. So here's what Kale was asking about with the classifications of epithelium. All we're going to do is say, okay, how many layers do you have? These ones all have one, because I, I can see that base foot membrane. These nuclei line up, and there's no other nuclei underneath here. So these are all going to start with simple. And then we're going to tell you what they look like. If they're really, really flat and thin, they're likely to be squamous. If they look like little cubes, they're likely to be, say, cuboidal. And these are columns or rectangles. Okay? And then here's our stratified. So go figure. I can have stratified squamous, right? Many layers. There's like four five layers of these nuclei depending on. I have cuboidal, right, stratified cuboidal, and I have stratified columnar, right? And then I have, <coughs> then I have pseudostratified. So this, this prefix always means false. So the layered appearance is a false, it's a false notion. This is actually only one cell layer thick. The problem is the cells are different sizes. Some are shorter, some are taller. So the nuclei are on different levels. So when you look at it, it looks like this is a layer of cells and this is a layer of cells. But it's not. It's pseudo stratified. And then we would follow it again, because that's just telling you the number of layers by cuboidal columns or whatever. Okay? Now. 
There is one more type of epithelium, and you won't look at this in lab, and, and again, not sorry, it's called transitional epithelium. And um, I don't see, yeah, there it is. It's down here on this square. You guys should have the same. These are the same posters that are hanging outside. This is basically, transitional means you change, right? You're in transition. I'm in transition in my life right now. I'm changing, right? I'm going from one thing to another thing. So transitional epithelium, it changes its, the number of layers it has and the, the shapes of the cell. And that's why it's called transition. And it does it for a reason, but that's the way it gets its name. And they don't have a cartoon here for that, but this is your goal. So you guys will be looking at the simples, all the simples in lab. You'll be looking at a pseudostratified in lab, and then you look at a stratified squamous. You won't look at these two because they're very rare in the body. They're just not very as common. They're not needed to the extent, again, but they, they are there in the body, but they're not as common. So how do you know? Go ahead. I'll, I'll how do you know if it, uh, like, when a certain people would or how do you? It's a shape. You get used to the shapes of the cells. So when we ask it on a practical, we're going to find a, a field of, of the, on the slide that is really shows you square cells. But you have to you have to get the practice in to look at it this. Okay. Because otherwise it, it's not you're not so familiar. So you have to get used to this of thinking, what am I looking at? And that's why I say to students, look your best bet in lab for learning this at this you know, because you got this week and uh, what? I think our part of next semester. Okay. So here's your, here's what you're gonna want to do is you want to find with your group or with whoever you study with, and you want to grab slides. You know, uh, if not if not today because maybe you just you're just doing a feeling connected. Whatever you're doing today, you want to grab all the slides the instructor says you need to do. You want to get used to them, and then sometime you know towards the end of this week, right, beginning of next week, you want to cover all those slides, and you want to quiz each other, okay. and you want to keep quizzing each other. And you want to say, you, you know, somebody, you split them up into, you know, half and half if there's two of you or, you know, thirds if there's three of you. And you each begin to, you grab as many microscopes because it's first come, first serve in open labs, right? <laughs> right? And you just set them up. And and so I tell students, because what you're going to want to do is you're on a basis of comparison. If you, so in other words, if I just put a slide on one microscope and I said, name this, maybe most of you couldn't name it at all. And, and even, even with your practice there. But on a practical, you'll have like five or so slides, like microscopes. So I say to students, we'll get used to comparing and contrasting. Get used to thinking about, first of all, what do I see when I look at that field? And then, and then, right, try again to see, see if you can discern a shape or uh, layers. And if you draw a blank, we'll just move on because you'll come to another slide and you'll go, okay, I got that. That is definitely, let's say bone, because bone is, Bone is so distinct. Bone right there behind you. It's a really, really distinct tissue. And you're like, okay, I know that's bone, so that one couldn't be bone, right? It's, it was, and we'll try to figure it out. And like I said, and if you've got a lot of space next to the cells, it's probably some type of epithelium. So all you have to do is try to try to count layers. So if, sim if it's simple, it has one cell, and if it's stratified, it has multiple cells? Layers, yeah, okay. layers, okay? So here's what the difference is in looking at this. So this is the difference in the way it's cut, right? So if I'm looking straight down on squamous cells, they always look like fried eggs. That's the way I've always described them. They're so cool. They're just so, and there's easily I can see the cell membrane nucleus next to another cell and tight, tight junctions. And and so those squamous cells again, epithelium, nice. Now what you don't appreciate looking down like this is the fact that they are so thin. That's one as well. If I do it from profile, right? I turn it sideways. Here's what I got. There's the nucleus. Okay, your microscope, it's not that distinct. We don't generally find them on no. those microscopes like this. We find them like this. All right, that's a capillary. This is an alveoli. So we do use the lungs because the lungs have 300 million alveoli in it. So there's a lot of these. And so the alveoli gives a structure, but structures are always made of tissues. So here's again, nucleus, thin cell. Nucleus, thin cell. That's creating this bubble that we think of as the alveoli. Here's that first contact, right? Here's the lumen of a capillary. Yep, that's simple squamous. And they're all over in the lung. You can find simple squamous because it is the, it's what a capillary is made of throughout the body, honestly, in almost any cell tissue slide you take. But now I say, do you think this would be a good barrier? Would this provide you a lot of protection? 
No, no. I certainly <laughs> wouldn't. I wouldn't count on it. Okay, and I've already told you we find this right in the lungs, and and not the rest of the respiratory tract. That'll be another type of epithelium. But in the lungs, in the alveoli, there are a lot of simple squamous cells. In the capillaries are only simple squamous squamous simple squamous cells. Your kidneys, because you can see this in your kidney slides too. Your kidney slides up to there. Simple squamous. So this is a microscopic model. So because we have those, sometimes we don't really use the kidney. Nice, simple squamous. Right? These are cuboidal. So it depends on what I need done. I'm not cut a wall. Let's stick there. Right? So no, these are not going to be good barriers. We're going to find them in, in places where where I want to filter or diffuse. So if I want to get something moved only by concentration gradients, high to low, or by pressure and size, because that's what these two things mean, I'll put a squamous cell there. And why? Because I don't have far to go. Right? Think about what you're doing here in your lungs. What's in here? We'll take a guess. What's here inside this alveoli? The, the ball, ball. What's that? No, 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 we're not there yet. We get plenty of that in the body, but not there yet. So this, again, I said first contact. What am I making first contact with? What? One more, a little out Okay. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not ready for that yet. What's it? Air. Absolutely, right? I inhaled all this air through all these open tubes that we like to keep open. The mucus will close them. That's the problem. Right? Anyway, we can't have mucus here, right? We do produce mucus in upper parts, but those tubes are much bigger. This is a really small sac. So I want the oxygen to get into here, don't I? Because that's my blood. And I want the carbon dioxide in here to get out here so I can exhale it and get it out of the body because it's waste. Y'all with me? This distance is only a tenth of a micron. It is one of the shortest distances between layers. I mean, I got this layer, I got a layer here, I got a layer here. But these cells are so thin, right, that I don't have far to go. So I can move really fast, which is really good news because I like my oxygen. I don't know about you guys, but I like it, right? <laughs> and I like to get rid of carbon dioxide. This is why people die when fluids build up in pneumonia or mucus is excessive or asthma occurs because you slow this process down. If I start coating the inside of this with liquids or the outside of this with liquids and pneumonia, I have, it's going to take longer to move that oxygen. Because now I have a greater distance to move it, don't I? It's going to take longer to get that carbon dioxide out. That's where you guys need to be. This is where I need to be looking at these tissues and thinking about it. What job are you going to do? How are you going to keep me alive? And then how do I die when things go wrong? All right, so I'll just finish up this slide. So again, this is the stuff we put in our serous membranes, the simple squamous, because I just want to prevent abrasions. I just want to keep you guys from rubbing against each other. But I don't have a lot of space in that cavity, right? I can't put a big thick membrane around you, that wouldn't work. Think about what's going to work. Think on some level if you would, if you were the, a creator and you had to create life, what is it going to look like? How are you going to keep it to meeting all these functions? There's a lot of trade-offs in the body, but it's not that hard, I promise you. Once you begin to start looking at things and thinking in a curious manner, why? Why would it need to be like that? All right? Okay, we'll pick up on this um, on Thursday.